Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. My name's Richard Hay. I'm a uh, tax lawyer in the city. I've practiced here for 25 years. I was uh, an academic for uh, half a dozen years before that, so I've been thinking a lot about uh, offshore centers and the way they interact with um, onshore uh, financial markets, and it's a pleasure to be here, including with Nicholas. I certainly enjoyed his uh, book, uh, Treasure Islands. I recommend it to uh, all of you. I, I, as uh, Michael said, I don't agree with uh, a lot of it, although he reports a lot of interesting things, and it's certainly a case to answer for the financial services industry. Uh, Mm. Here we go. So by way of uh, introduction to my remarks, I'm going to uh, sort of cover about five themes here. I'm going to talk about why international financial centers exist. I'm going to talk a little bit about tax, the question of uh, morality and tax, regulatory standards, globalization, and uh, conclude with some comments on the future for international financial services. And just before I give you the benefit of my views, I wonder if I could get a sense of yours. And maybe I'll start with, uh, obviously, a very complicated proposition. Let me reduce, reduce it to something rather simple, inappropriately, I know. But globalization, good or bad? Those who think globalization is basically good, OK? And those who see globalization as essentially bad? OK, thank you very much. And um, as far as international financial centers go, or let's say offshore financial centers, um, should they be shut down if the world was able to do that? Yes <coughs> or no? OK, all right. Not as much of an uphill struggle as I, I might have thought. Um, so uh, I think Nicholas and I have a lot of uh, common ground. I I'd like to think we do. If he doesn't agree with these propositions, I hope he'll tell me. But uh, I think we all recognize the importance of prosperous economies to support healthy public finances and private investment, development, poverty alleviation. I mean, even socialists like to have money because we like to give it away. If we, if we don't start off with a productive economy, uh, we, uh, we have a problem right from the start. And I guess... If we do value prosperous economies, then I think we all accept that uh, business makes a contribution to that. Uh, they conduct trade, uh, they contribute to economic growth, certainly uh, they employ people. Um, and if we agree that business has some merit to it, I appreciate that uh, there are issues about trust and regulation, but if broadly speaking we think business contributes to prosperity, then I think we also need to recognize that business needs infrastructure. I mean, Nicholas has referred to road schools and hospitals, but I think we need also recognize that business requires a sound and stable legal system, trained professionals to facilitate business, to do the kind of transactions that Michael was describing, uh, the deals between the pharmaceutical companies in France and uh, the United States. And of course, um, business also requires financial services facilities. And a lot of this takes place, at least in the cross-border context, between international financial centers. They get a bad rap in the press. And you know, as respects why this happens, they conduct financial services. They facilitate business. They facilitate globalization. This is a tough gig in the current world. I mean, the, the public is highly critical of uh, these components, so they're not very well positioned in terms of uh, attracting a lot of uh, applause from the public. And as respects the offshore dimension of this, of course, it is by definition foreign to the country or the press where the criticism arises. Have you ever noticed this dynamic? You've got a bunch of people in a room, they're looking at a problem, they're thinking about who caused it. Pretty regularly, the person who caused it is one outside the room, right? <laughs> So, you know, being foreign is a bit of a disadvantage. Now, I think there is one thing that I would lay at the door of the IFCs, so small and large. I think they haven't done enough to explain to a skeptical public post uh, the financial services crash why their activity is socially or economically constructive. And I think for this reason, the media, of course, who doesn't print stories like shock 
finance is well regulated. You know, that doesn't sell newspapers. It's the sort of uh, lurid stories that uh, comment on criminality and uh, the, the negatives, of course, that sell newspapers. So we do get a focus on, on the negative dimension. And I don't think the IF people who staff the IFCs, the ordinary workers there, take too much time off, to their, off from their day jobs to explain to us why what they do matters. So what, do, what, what essentially, what, what's the essence of financial services activity in society? Well, I would say that uh, they conduct capital formation, they collectivize capital, and they transmit it through investment to support trade and economic growth. I mean, if you doubt the importance of financial services in this process, think back to uh, the dark days of the first quarter of 2008 where we feared global meltdown as a result of the disruption of the financi of financial services. I mean, it it, it's a very important function in society. Uh, and of course, financial services are strategically important for countries that control them. In the cross-border context, they facilitate the allocation of footloose capital. And what could be more important in a globalizing economy or global economy than directing where capital is deployed? I mean, the United Kingdom is very successful at this. You may be aware that the United Kingdom and its offshore satellites runs 25% of cross-border inter intermediation in the world. I'm not talking just about the UK, but the, 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 the network of offshore centers that supports it is, is dominant globally in uh, the transmission of uh, capital and the formation of it. The United States is about 12%, I mean, of cross-border capital. It's a very big uh, market, but much of the United States, of course, is domestic in nature. Countries compete to control this very important activity. It's a very significant advantage for the United Kingdom that it occupies pole position in the world in this. And of course, I also make the point that uh, the activity generates good jobs in the information uh, economy. So it's, it, it's a very attractive um, business line. And of course, that's not enough to justify it. I fully accept that. But I think let, let, let's just... Uh, recognize the fact that as a business activity, there are many, many who would like to host it if the United Kingdom stumbled and made it available to others. So why do international financial centers exist? I mean, Nicholas has described them as an escape. Um, the, the, the perspective that I have, and I've spent 25 years, as I mentioned, as a tax lawyer in the city of London, uh, the world is politically segmented, but economically integrated. And we have tax systems in major countries that are really national fiefdoms. They are ill-suited to facilitating cross-border commercial intercourse. They're really designed to trap revenue within their borders. So the international financial services lubricate the connections between countries. I'm going to uh, review how that happens in a moment, and I think that uh, without that, as Michael described in his pharmaceutical uh, example, it would be very difficult for a lot of business to, uh, to take place. Now, I did notice in your book, Nicholas, that um, the overall tone of it is that international financial services are a giant criminal enterprise. <laughs> How many people would share that proposition? <laughs> Uh, you know, I just don't look at it that way. I'm, I'm mindful of the fact, as Nicholas would be, there's a billion cross-border financial tra transactions in a day. I mean, the, the, the scale of financial transactions is enormous. And granted, uh, the, you know, if, you, if you read uh, Nicholas's book, he's got a lot of florid prose in it, I would say, that looks, you know, uses words like murky, etc. Uh, you know, there's plenty of stories. I mean, let's face it, when you've got a degree of activity this large in the world, you're going to have uh, criminal activity associated with it. In fact, finance is the lifeblood, not only of business activity, but criminal activity. So you're going to expect quite a bit of criminal activity around financial services. It's not that financial services cause it, but they're in business to make money, just like most other businesses, criminals, and uh, they're going to be attracted to the financial system. 
And of course, this also poses a question to I me. Mean, we, we do want to contain the elements of it that we regard as um, criminal, so we need regulation. I'm going to comment a little bit on this, but the question I'm going to throw out from the outset is the importance of cost-benefit analysis in regulating financial services. You know, if you take the view that financial services are a giant criminal enterprise, then anything you can do to slow this beast down is sensible, obviously. You're trying to discourage crime. But if you think financial services has a role to play that's constructive in society, then you need to be a bit cautious about hobbling its ability to perform that central role. I'm going to come back to that. Who uses international financial centers? Well, multinational corporations do, of course. Hedge funds, private equity, venture capital, insurance, rich people, ordinary people. How many people think ordinary people don't use in, uh, international financial centers? Okay. And how many people think that ordinary people do use offshore services? Okay. Well, I'm going to show you how ordinary people, people with workplace pensions, are heavily reliant on offshore services. In fact, they're probably the biggest user group in the world. When I meet an MP from Glasgow who says, my constituents hate offshore centers. They never use them. They think they're for big companies and the rich. I say to him, do they have workplace pensions? Of course they do. And is some of this money invested internationally? Do they want diversification in their portfolio? Do they want investment in high growth economies elsewhere beyond Europe? Of course they do. What the, one of the primary sources of capital in the offshore world are pension funds Coll in, or collective funds of any nature. So just to illustrate how this works in the Cayman context, we've got, let's say, three investors. We've got pension fund, private investors, other institutional investors. They come from countries with disparate tax characteristics, they want to collectivize their funds. They want to put their money together in one place and then invest it. That's what funds do in the offshore center. They form capital there and they transmit it through to China or Africa or a G8 country where the investment is uh, deployed. There will be tax, you see down at the bottom there in the source country. You have a big pension fund that's going to invest in a G8 country or in Africa, depending on local rules, they'll pay whatever tax is due. They won't pay tax on the neutral platform where they get together, but they will pay tax, again, in the country of residence. I mean, depending on the rules, sometimes pension funds are exempt, typically private investors aren't, but we end up in this process with two layers of tax and not three. And actually, the fact that Cayman forgoes its potential tax levy is actually quite attractive. What it means when the money gets back to, for example, the UK or the US, where the ultimate investor lives, is there's no tax credit for that tax paid offshore. If Cayman levied tax at 10%, only 90% of the money would be left when it came back to the UK. They'd either give a tax credit or they would have less money to tax, the fact that Cayman forgoes its tax take there is actually a big benefit. And the suggestion that it's otherwise, that somehow by forgoing tax they're part of a criminal enterprise is really a slightly, to my way of thinking, a slightly odd way of, uh, of looking at it. Now, let's look at this in, in another context. Let's look at an uh, investment by, by a group of investors, let's say we're going to get together, pool capital, and invest in China. We're going to invest in an infrastructure project in China. Now, they ought to go through BVI or Cayman. Why would they do that? Many would, would assume that's because there's some sort of monkey business involved in, uh, in, in the tax domain. Somehow this is a drop-off or they avoid tax. The real reason why they do it is because they trust the legal system in Cayman to regulate their affairs in your state. If you have a financier that's going to provide money to this group of investors and they want to accelerate their loan, 
Imagine their position if they had to go directly to a Chinese company before a Chinese judge. Maybe they're entitled to accelerate their loan, but if they do that, the capital is going to leave the Chinese enterprise and maybe the business would collapse and cause some problems in China. Now what would you do if you're a Chinese judge? They don't want their affairs regulated under Chinese law with Chinese professionals and Chinese judges. They want a predictable legal system that they can have recourse to if there's a, if there's a dispute between them. And if you look at this from the perspective of the United Kingdom, this is a huge benefit because it means that even though the United Kingdom is not the imperial power it was at one time, it still has considerable influence in the global economy because its legal system is trusted around the world. People feel comfortable with British legal infrastructure. And don't forget, this generates jobs not only for the finance institutions in the City of London, but it's also very important for the financial services community here. It's a way for the United Kingdom to preserve its cultural influence and input into a globalizing economy. People come to these centers because they trust their infrastructure. I mean, as you can see, they're paying, again here, two layers of tax. They're paying tax where the money is invested, under whatever terms that country chooses to tax, and they're going to pay tax when they get their money home. The suggestion that these international investors are somehow trying to evade tax or some engage in criminal activity by meeting in a tax-neutral place where they trust the laws, to my way of thinking, just doesn't make sense. And th this is the principal activity in, for example, uh, British Virgin Islands. 70% of the companies in the British Virgin Islands are incorporated for the Middle East, for uh, investment in China, and for investment in Russia, where, truth be told, people are not that comfortable with the legal systems. The British proposition, yes, we trust that. So let's have a quick stop on the question of morality in taxation. I mean, morality has a very important role to play in the tax context. When we design our rules for taxation, morality and the allocation of resources in society is a very important consideration. But when it comes to tax compliance and enforcement, it must be according to law. There is no other way. How can you have everyone expressing a view about whether somebody else should pay tax? It can't work like that. As Michael noted in his opening remarks, the way it worked with Starbucks just doesn't make sense. How can you have a company that's exposed to tax if there's a great hue and cry in the press? It can't work like that. And I, I, this is not my idea. This comes from Michael Devereaux, who runs the Oxford Center for Business Taxation. This is the leading group of tax academics in the country. At the end of the day, he says, it has to come down to law. That's the only way you can take people's property away from them. Now, Nicholas has made the point that countries create incentives to attract international capital. And of course, this is what Margaret Hodge has been complaining about in the Public Accounts Committee, that um, Google, Starbucks, Amazon somehow managed to spirit their money out of the country through uh, often uh, payments for brand payments. That was a big thing with Starbucks, of course, it was paying to uh, Ireland and, uh, of course, uh, Benelux is conventional too. If the United Kingdom doesn't like that, they can just deny deductibility for royalties in the United Kingdom. Bingo. Fixed. They don't want to do that, though, because they don't want to take the economic and ultimately voter consequences that go with that decision. So they prefer to lay out the bait to attract the multinationals in and then complain that they use it. But where's the sense in that? If the politicians don't like the rules or the outcome under them, change the rules. On the subject of tax competition, the literature is very mixed on this. Um, and I, I note that Nick doesn't have much regard for the literature. I must say myself, I often defer to, uh, 
to, to academics on these calls. I'm not the most experienced on them. I'm not an economist myself, but um, the, the, broadly speaking, the U.S. is comfortable with tax and regulatory competition. They've operated a laboratory there for 250 years. They've got 50 states that compete with each other. They've had plenty of experience, a couple of centuries of experience, to evaluate what the implications of that are. And the Americans are comfortable with competition. In the EU, they're not. You know, it's a series of national fiefdoms. Look at how hard it is for them to cooperate in a common construct in the EU. It's just, you know, alien to the way they proceed in the UK. And, you know, you, you, you often get this, um, this narrative in the press that tax competition is ruining public finances or that, you know, payments to offshore centers or crafty tax professionals or multi multinational corporations that, you know, the, the public finance in Europe are going to hell in a handbasket because you've got so many people who are undermining the system. Well, look, here's the reality. In the EU, they take, but through tax, nearly 50% of GDP. Governments don't produce that. That's what they take away from individuals and businesses in tax and spend. They get 50%. How serious is this problem with a race to the bottom? How much more do they need? In France, they have 55%. Finland takes 57. What do they need, like 80%? Shouldn't they leave a little bit in the pot so that business can invest and produce the, uh, the, the uh, economic goods going forward? Singapore and Hong Kong, have tw they, they, the governments take 22% of GDP. They're pretty successful economies. Now, if you were in a region that was taking 50%, how would that affect your, not your, your competitiveness? I mean, it's gonna be difficult, right? Your company set up there, they're gonna be paying much higher taxes, you're gonna have difficulty attracting capital, that would be certainly my perception. And I th think as well, you wouldn't be too keen on competition because you often find yourself on the back end of it. Just, I mean, I, I mentioned this in the, uh, the, the, the literature in the U.S. context, but by the way, this is a great book. If anybody's interested in this subject, this book uh, edited by Andrew Morris, M-O-R-R-I-S-S, available on Amazon. Not quite the big seller that uh, Nick's book was. Top 10 on Amazon, by the way, when it came out. But this book looks at uh, offshore financial centers and regulatory competition. Now, a lot of the, it's written from an American perspective, and you'll see, I take a much different view, a quite a benign view on uh, tax competition. <clears throat> oh, and, and what, the, the one I was just showing you here, this is a Chatham House publication from last year. You can kind of guess the, the, the broad uh, nature of the content from it, but I just note this, that even in uh, the UK, I think you're a fellow at Chatham House, Nick, so no doubt, no, no doubt a colleague, a former colleague of yours. Um, here's a, not just one more uh, commentary on Europe. Uh, this first comment here I attribute to Angela Merkel. She's pointed out that Europe has 7% of the world's population, 25% of its GDP, and pays 50% of its social welfare spending. I mean, this is a problem. This is a problem with public finances. You know, you, you I, and I, I it, often we like to think that we can continue this comfortable environment. I mean, why not? Uh, no one wants to take the punch bowl away and stop the party. Certainly politicians don't want to do it on their own watch. They want to leave it to the next lot to have to do it. But the conclusion that I draw from this is that enhanced tax collection and reform are not enough to achieve sustainable finances. We need some structural changes in government expenditure in Europe. Sorry about that, but you know, we, at the moment we're on borrowed time. We can all feel that. on the subject of regulation. Well, first of all, bear in mind that I, I made the point earlier that countries compete to host financial services. Very important point to bear in mind is that if you're a dominant country setting the rules, you can use regulation to harass competitors. And a lot of what we see going on that passes for regulation of financial services is really 
countries who are successful or maybe see their position slipping, uh, want to entrench their position by adopting regulation that flatters their own commercial interests. So just bear in mind, this isn't quite the arid antiseptic process that you might think it is. I'm not saying that there isn't a lot of merit in it, but you know, it's part of the competitive process. And Nick's uh, uh, commented on secrecy. I think he probably, he notes that this happens with uh, centers large and small. Um, there's a lot of debate at the moment about whether we should have public registers for companies and trusts. Uh, our prime minister is committed to that in the United Kingdom. I must say, I have serious reservations about that. And it's one thing Nick and I might discuss a little bit. But you may know that in the British offshore centers, they collect beneficial ownership information on companies and trusts, and they have done so for a decade. They hold that information in private hands and they make it available to government when they ask for it. The suggestion that they're secretive, well, they, they are much less so, I would say. And I, I don't know that Nick would disagree with this, but he'll get a chance to give us his view that they're, they're much more transparent and information is much more readily available there on uh, beneficial ownership than it is in, um, in the United Kingdom or the United States. And we're going to illustrate this, and I include within this Benelux, Netherlands in particular. Uh, Switzerland's very good at that. They've collected uh, beneficial ownership for some time. Of the G8 countries, France has ambitions to do it, the United Kingdom. None of them are anywhere near as advanced on this, which is really the core of secrecy as uh, the British offshore centers. So you get the impression from reading the press that the big countries are all well organized on this and they just need to bring the, the smaller ones up to their standard. We need a level playing field. I say, bring it on. The smaller centers occupy a leading position on this. In our practice, we produced this book on the left towards a level playing field in 2003. And the purpose of this book was to show to the OECD five years after they'd launched their initiative, their attack on small financial centers, that actually standards in the small financial centers for transparency were higher than they were in OECD countries. And OECD took a bit of a black eye on this. It took them a few years to get organized to do their own research. But as you see in 2006, they, be they, began they had realized by this time that the blockage in achieving success in their process was not the cooperation of the small financial centers, but the cooperation of their own members, the big countries, who could self-exempt from the standards they wanted to export to others. And where are we now? Well, Michael referred to this project. It was conducted by three academics. The best, probably the best known of the three is an Australian by the name of Jason Sharman. Uh, they had a really cool project. What they did was they... Um, sent out email solicitations to 7,500 corporate service providers in 182 countries around the world. They said, we'd like to incorporate a shell company. We want to avoid excessive tax. And they put suggestions in there that maybe there might be terrorist activity, et cetera. Just the sort of things that would have put your antenna up if you were a service provider. You could see some mischief coming on this. And then what they did was they checked to see who offered to establish the company without asking for the uh, ownership information that is required under international standards. So it's just a purely empirical exercise, no load in, it's not like they're going into the United States and they're being nice there because the United States pays the fees of the agency conducting the evaluation, which often skews outcomes. They just sent out these blind emails and waited to see what came, came back. And guess what happened? This is the list from top to bottom of compliance with international standards. The ones at the tippy top are the British offshore centers. Around the middle, the United Kingdom. And actually, this is a little misplaced. It's a little too high on the graph. This is the US line right here. The bottom of uh, compliance globally was in the United States. Why? They have the capacity to self-exempt. So I just point this out 10 years after we challenged the OECD and said, get your own countries in line. If this is really important, if secrecy is destroying the global economy, you should be able to get the countries who run your project in line. 
And the United States funds 23% of the OECD budget. When I kept needling the head of the project, he said to me eventually, what do you expect me to do? About the United States, you know, I said to him, you need to get the United States on board. What he meant was, if I criticize them, the lights will go out in my office. <laughs> so, uh, globalization, I think this is my penultimate slide, I haven't got much left. Uh, what's its impact on developing countries and, you know, how does, what's the role that financial services plays in this? Well, China, of course, has been the biggest poverty reduction machine in history. Over the last two, three decades, they've had 500 million people come out of poverty. Now, there are many reasons for that. Agricultural reform is one, probably the dominant one. But does anybody think that China would have emancipated as quickly without the local presence of Hong Kong and Singapore? You know, what's interesting about this is when Hong Kong reverted to China, China lectured, sorry, the United Kingdom lectured China about the importance of keeping Hong Kong's special status as a, a regional financial center. They regarded that as critically important to development in the region. Fast forward 12 years later to the G20 hosted by the UK in 2009. And the UK and France were planning to shut down the offshore world. Does anybody remember what country derailed the United Kingdom on that? China. China was the one who said, no, you can't interfere with these offshore centers. They put it on the basis of uh, the importance of um, not coming after Hong Kong and Macau, but had a chance to speak to uh, some senior Chinese policymakers afterwards, and they said, these centers are important to us. We're on top now, and we are capital exporters. We want these places so we can intermediate our funds out and buy commodities and uh, whatnot that we need in order to, uh, to grow. So the Chinese certainly recognize the value of this, and it's contributed, I think, materially to poverty reduction there. International finance is obviously required for investment and development. Um, I, 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 well, this third bullet point, does it curtail crony allocation of capital? You know, one of the key problems you have with corruption in countries is that capital is restricted to those closely connected with the elite. So what happens in China? You've got an entrepreneur in the hinterland, not connected with the elite. He needs capital for his business. He can't get it because he's not connected with the leadership. What he does is he goes to Hong Kong. He's got a relative in Hong Kong. He gets the money he needs from Hong Kong starts his business somewhere in the middle of China. Are the Chinese upset about that? Not a bit of it. They had their money to give to cronies, and they got active business enterprise financed by somewhere outside. Contrast the same entrepreneur in Africa. Where does he go? Maybe Mauritius? Just a little suggestion here that it may be that Africa suffers from a dearth of proximate finance centers, that their economic development is held back by that. My last slide here, the future for international financial centers. One of my key points is that upgraded regulation should take cost-benefit analysis into account. One of the taunts we get from NGOs is, well, if you believe in transparency, etc., how come you won't incur a limited cost to get it? Answer, because we think that, you know, one needs to think about cost-benefit in this. Is this worth taking on? Is it important to do this? And in fact, the Financial Action Task Force, the global anti-money laundering chiefdoms in, uh, in the world, these guys have never, ever, since 1989 when they were founded, done cost-benefit analysis on their work. Why? They know what the outcome would be. They've seen the academic studies that have done it that have suggested that this regulation has been far more costly than the, the benefits it's created. FATCA, you're probably familiar with that. I won't go into the details there, but that's throwing private money on the bonfire to collect the ashes. International financial centers support globalization. It kind of depends what you think about that. If you don't like globalization, you probably don't like IFCs. Importantly, of course, countries don't have friends. They have interests. And my principal reason for optimism about international financial centers is that G20 countries in particular will protect these centers 
for cross-border finance in their own interests. So the European perspective on this, maybe a little influenced by the way the French look at it, we can see this works in practice, but does it work in theory? <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm.